Yeah, so I said that matter can be distributed into two parts. One portion that is really, really small, so that is particles and things that are large that we deal with on daily basis, which are substances. And uh, substances, we said that they are mixtures, they are compounds, and they are elements. And elements and compounds are the ones that are pure because they're made of particles of one kind. And impure are the ones like mixtures. They are made of particles of different kind. And gave examples of what mixtures are. For example, steel is a mixture. All alloys, in fact, uh, air is a mixture. Sea water is a mixture. Uh, but then we spent a couple of days on trying to understand how to convert mixture and get pure substances out of it. And that we call purification techniques. So we learned about compounds, we learned about elements and how we can make those. And we also learned to appreciate the differences between compounds and mixtures that one has chemical properties, which are kind of fixed and the other has physical properties, which are quite variable depending on how much of one thing is present in the mixture. But in all of that discussion, we never really focused on what particle was. Like we were saying that, oh, this has particles of one kind and that has particles of the other kind, but we weren't really focused on what particle was. We just said that that's what makes everything up. Even before that, when we talked about, when we talked about kinetic particle theory, we still said, oh, particles are there, particles move, particles attract each other and particles have these forces that you overcome if you give them extra energy. And that's how things melt and that's how things boil. And impurities will raise the boiling point and impurities will lower the melting point. All of that, we talked about it, but we never really focused on what particles were. And in fact, that was deliberate. The reason was that particles are unlike anything that we've seen, They're like really weird. They behave in their own manner and they have these weird rules that we won't see anywhere else. But that doesn't mean that we can study them. So particles, we divide them into three main kinds, atoms, ions, molecules. And atoms are the ones that we are going to focus mainly on today. And any atom, first of all, atom shouldn't be called atom. It's a bad name, honestly. Like atom is anything but atom. Uh, the reason for that is that atom word, I'm sure you know already, that atom means something that is not divisible, right? But we know, like theoretically we know since 1905, but definitely, from experimental evidence, we know since 1940s that atom is anything but divisible. Uh, like uh, <clears throat> you can get so many things out of it. Like initially people thought, oh, there is just one atom and that's it. We cannot divide stuff any further. And people thought that just like, uh, there was a famous example in one of the O-level books that you take a meatloaf and you start slicing it out and eventually you get to a point where you cannot slice it any further. But atoms not like sliced bread. Atoms make stuff up and they are at the heart of everything. But they are a world of their own. Like initially people thought that, oh, there are just three small parts of any atom and we call them subatomic particles. So subatomic particle means that things that are smaller than atoms, but they're particles. So people said that, oh, there is proton, there is neutron, and there's electrons. So certainly they are there, but here's the thing. So far, people have discovered more than, I would say, I think more than a hundred particles that are smaller than atoms in fact. So atoms have a whole myriad of different particles in there, but these three play an important role. And for any introductory topic like O-levels, I think this is good enough. So here's the thing, <laughs> particles that they're there, why is atom special then? So the main thing why atom is special is that atom can behave like element. Remember that we talked about substance. So every substance has its own property, right? So you take a proton, it doesn't behave like any substance. Like just proton doesn't behave like an element. It doesn't behave like a compound. It doesn't behave like a mixture, but you take one atom. Let's suppose you take an atom of iron. It has all the properties that iron as a substance would do as an element, I mean. So that's the thing, atom is special because when you start to zoom into matter and you eventually get to a really, really small space where there are atoms, then although you can keep zooming in and get to protons, neutrons, and electrons, but atom is where the things stop being elements. So atom is the smallest particle of matter that can have chemical properties. And 
instead of saying chemical properties, we usually say that can behave like element. That's why atoms are special. There's nothing else special about them. It's not that they're the smallest. It's not that they're heaviest, nothing. It's just that you, that is the limit at which everything stops behaving like a substance. And once you zoom in, you are down to another level of new properties and new particles, okay? So atom is the smallest particle that can behave like an element. All right? <clears throat> Now, sub subatomic particles, there are three main ones that we are going to study about, and they have their own properties. So they differ in two main ways. One is the mass, and the other is the charge. Now, the thing is, because they're really, really small, we tend to not consider their actual mass. Like, proton has a mass of 9.11 times 10 to the power of minus 31 kg. That's ridiculously small. So what we do is instead we give them a relative mass. Relative means that we are comparing them to each other, not to kg, the one, the unit that we measure for our daily life. We basically use it. The relative mass allows us to compare them with each other, which I think is only fair. Same for charge. The charge of any proton or electron is really, really small, zero point, and then you put 18 zeros and then you get one six Coulomb. That's really small. So what we do is we put relative charge. Relative charge allows us to compare them with each other, which is fair again. So protons have a relative mass of one. Neutrons have a relative mass of approximately one. It's a little more, but we're going to ignore that for now. And electrons are so small that we can simply ignore them. Like we can say that there is negligible mass here. Of course, it's not entirely zero, but it's pretty close. Imagine uh, comparing mass of uh, what? Yeah, imagine comparing mass of a small kid to an adult elephant, something like that. The mass doesn't compare, right? Or imagine comparing your mass to maybe a large truck. So it doesn't really compare, right? Just like that, electrons are really small. You can have almost 1800 plus electrons on one side of the scale and they will be balanced out by just one teeny tiny proton. So that's the thing, electrons and protons, the mass difference is huge, which is why we say that electrons have negligible mass. And in all our calculations, we don't really consider electrons having some mass, but electrons, even though they're small, they're not insignificant because they have something that no other subatomic particle does. And that is negative one charge, which is, Pretty amazing for such a small thing to have. And protons have exact opposite, which is positive one, which means that one proton and one electron, even with such a stark difference in their mass, the charges cancel out. And that is at the basis of uh, most of the chemical reactions, in fact. Uh, especially in the next chapter, we're going to talk about chemical bonding. That all depends on having a stable charge or a neutral configuration which gives properties to different substances. And if an atom for some reason has a uh, doesn't have a balance in the charges, it goes berserk. It starts behaving in really erratic ways and starts to latch on to other things to react and all that. So having a balance is important for atoms. Neutrons are the ones that restore that balance to some extent. Basically neutrons are neutral. So they have zero charge. They have mass, but they have zero charge. Now, where are they found? So the location within an atom for proton and neutron is nucleus. So nucleus is at the center of any atom and that is where they are combined. Of course, protons will repel other protons, right? Because they are all positive. So there is a force inside the nucleus that keeps them there. So that, force is so strong that it's actually called strong force. Okay. So protons are pulled together by that strong force to make a nucleus. Otherwise they'll just repel each other and fly away. And electrons are actually moving around and flying around in what we call the space of the nucleus uh, of the atom. So the outer space in the uh, atom where outside the nucleus. Now, how big is this space compared to the nucleus? Uh, huge compared to the nucleus. So a common example in books that they give is that if you look at a stadium, a regular stadium, and you compare the size of the stadium to one cricket ball or one football 
then you know that that is the relative size of how big the space is where electrons move around and what the size of the nucleus is. So the difference is huge, okay? But that doesn't stop things from being significant and that doesn't stop atoms from getting properties from protons and neutrons and electrons, okay? So, so far we know that atoms have protons and electrons, which are the ones responsible for charges and atoms have uh, these, um, what do you call it? Neutrons to restore the balance and neutrons are the ones that give them mass, okay? So here is what a general atom would look like. So let's suppose, here you go. So this is a good depiction of what an atom would look like. So you have these electrons, which are in the blue, moving around. So there's no set pattern as to where they are, okay? You can see that most of them are clustered in towards the red dot. And that red dot is basically the nucleus and electrons are moving around. So most of the volume of that atom is empty and it just has electrons in it. And at the heart of it, you have nucleus. And since a few years, O-levels exams, they do not ask you to draw protons and neutrons together. Like it's been a few years, I think 15 or 16 years. Yeah. So now we just put the nucleus in the center, one circle for it. And even if you don't want to put a circle for it, you just write the symbol of the element. So if I wanted to draw hydrogen, I will just write H and then the space around it. So I don't have to draw the circle for that. Now, how do these things behave and how do we know that they have different charges? So here's how we know that. So, you know, electric fields, they have positive and negative terminals there. So here's what happens. Let's suppose you have particles coming in and you have protons, neutrons, and electrons, and there's an electric field. On one side, there's a positive charge. On one side, there's a negative charge. So the positive charge is going to attract the electrons and the negative charge is going to attract the protons, but neutrons are not being, going to be attracted and they're going to go straight through it. Uh, based on the way they curve, can anybody tell me why electron is curving more than protons? Any ideas why that's happening? Electrons are lighter, which means that even if you pull them with the same force, they will be affected more than protons. So protons are heavy. They don't bend as much as electrons would. So the path doesn't change as much. Uh, electrons are usually shown in O-level exams or IGCS exams. Electrons are usually shown to be moving in a circular path while uh, protons move in a parabola which is more uh, less bent as compared to circles. So this shows that protons are heavy, but electrons are lighter, but they have similar, they are affected similarly based on the charges. Okay, so we know protons are there, electrons are there. What exactly do these things do and what do they count for? So here's the thing. If I were to change protons in any particle, what would it mean? So if I change protons, so how will that affect uh, an, any atom? So if I change proton, it will become a new element. So what element anything is, it's identity of an element is based on how many protons it has. Remember this, this is really, really important. No element has the same number of protons as the other element. In fact, if you wanted to change that, you will actually create a new element. And that is how new elements are created in labs. You change the number of protons in the atoms that are there. Uh, <clears throat> electrons, if you change those, it doesn't have any effect on like it's not such a large scale effect on the identity of the particle, but it does affect its behavior. In fact, all the chemical behaviors, they are based on in one way or another on how many electrons are there in the atom. So this changes the chemical properties and basically that happens because it changes the charge and makes things into ions, okay? Or converts them back to atoms. And neutrons do another thing. And what they do is that they keep the elements the same, but they change its mass, which means that they make them isotopes. So isotopes are special because they are the same atoms that have same protons, so same element. They might have the same number of electrons as well. It's not necessary, but they might. But because of the neutrons being different, they will behave a little differently when it comes to their physical properties. So if you were to define it, and this definition is one of the examiner's favorite definitions. So I would suggest that you write it down that isotopes are atoms with the same number of protons and electrons, but a different number of neutrons. 
Okay, so here's how the examiner phrases it. One option is that the examiner would say, define isotopes in terms of subatomic particles. So when they're doing that, you know that they're asking us about proton, neutron, electron. So first of all, don't discuss electrons. They don't have anything to do with the identity of an isotope. So you say that they have the same number of protons, but different number of neutrons. They might have the same number of electrons, but that's not necessary, which is why we shouldn't discuss electrons. Okay, another way they ask the same question. They might say, define isotope, and they wouldn't give you any restrictions. You're free to choose whatever you want. So in that case, we will get help from two other terms that we know of. One is called mass number or nucleon number or even atomic mass. So in the old books, you'll find it to be written as atomic mass. In the new books, you usually see nucleon number because it tells me whatever is in the nucleus. So total number of protons, I'm going to write that as P positive and neutrons. So N zero is going to represent neutrons and it's going to happen throughout the course. So total number of protons and neutrons is what nucleon number is. Okay, so I can say that if this is A, then A is protons plus neutrons. There you go. So the other one is proton number, or it used to also be called atomic number. An atomic number is simply another name. So this is usually Z, and this is basically another name for protons. So it is the number of protons that anything has, which means that every element has its own proton number. All right. So nuclear number can be same for different elements. I'll give an example. Uh, another important thing to note from now on, make sure that you have a copy of periodicity in every class. Okay. So let's suppose you have calcium. So calcium has 20 protons and 40 is its nucleon number. So this is how usually they write it. Sometimes they write it like this, which is fine. The smaller number is always the proton number and the larger number is always the nucleon number. Sometimes they're the same, but we'll talk about it. You can also have argon. So argon can, let's suppose, be 18 and 40 as well. So now what we can see is that this 40 and that 40 is the same. So what does that mean? That means that they have the same mass, which means that the number of protons and neutrons is the same. But we can clearly see that the different proton number tells us that they are different elements. So that means if, if they have the same mass, then calcium must have two less neutrons than argon or argon must have two more pro neutrons than calcium to make up for the change in protons to, and to make overall mass the same. So it, it is possible for two things to have same overall mass. Uh, yes, Zan, go ahead, ask your question. Uh, say for example, for the isotope of an element, the proton number would be the same, right? Of an element, yeah, of course, because an isotope is always the one that has the same proton number but the mass is different. So yeah, the number of protons will have to be the same for them to be isotopes, yes. Oh, okay, I guess you have nuclear number So that's why I was confirming. I'm sorry if I said that, uh, scratch that, that's not true. Proton number must be the same for isotopes. Nuclear number can be different. In fact, it is different. Now here's important, another fact about isotopes. Because they have, they're the same element, their chemical properties are the same. The chemical behavior, because it comes from how many electrons it has and how they're arranged and everything, the chemical behavior is still the same for both of them. It is only the physical properties and physical properties like mass, density, uh, how easily does it evaporate, volatility of that thing. Those things are going to be affected by uh, something being an isotope, but not the chemical properties. Okay. So an example of Isotope would be that you have hydrogen, simplest example. So hydrogen is H1, H2, and H3. So here's, I have a very neat diagram for it. So you can see that these have their own names in fact. So here you can see that, that one is protium because it has one electron and one proton. Uh, the other is deuterium because it has one proton, one electron, same as the other one. But you see that blue dot that shows that it has gotten a neutron as well. 
Similarly, the third one, it has two neutrons and one proton again. One proton has to be there because it is hydrogen, right? So the proton number will not change in all of them, but the total mass is going to be different. So for this thing, the mass is one. For this thing, it is two. And for that thing, it is three. But the proton number, notice that it's one altogether. If proton number change, it won't be an isotope. It will be a totally new element. So proton number has to be the same. But here's the thing. How do we give them mass? What are we comparing them to? We compare them to one twelfth of carbon 12 atom. Now this can be a little like mind bending. One twelfth of carbon 12. Okay, hold on. So what does that mean? Uh, carbon has a mass 12. So carbon 12 isotope. That is one isotope of carbon. Carbon has many isotopes. So carbon 12 is one, carbon 13 is one, carbon 14 is one. Notice that I'm not writing the proton number because I'm assuming that they are all carbon. So it's going to be the same. But if I need you to write it, I'll write six. Now here's the thing. This is carbon 12, that's carbon 13, that's carbon 14. Carbon 12 is taken as standard by chemi chemists for reasons that you study in AS. Now, if this thing has a mass of 12 and I say, okay, what is one twelfth of that? What will that be? One, right? One by 12 times 12, this 12 cancels out and you are left with one. And that is unit. That is unit mass. And we measure the mass of every particle compared to that. So we say, okay, we have a scale on which carbon 12 is 12. Okay, so now one twelfth of that is one. So we have defined our unit. And using that unit, we are going to compare everything. So hydrogen on that scale is one. Uh, lithium on that scale is, the proton number is three. Mass is usually seven, so seven is that. But we also have lithium six, which means it's an isotope of lithium. So we write it like that, lithium six. Or so another way to write that would be lithium six, or we can write lithium six. So both of them mean that it's an isotope of lithium. Now, mass of iron on that scale might be 56, which means that it is equal to 56 hydrogens. Okay. And this thing, we call it relative molecular or relative mass. So if this relative mass is of an atom, we call it relative atomic mass. If it is relative mass of an isotope, we call it relative isotopic mass. If it's the relative mass of molecule, we call it relative molecular mass. Sometimes we also get relative ionic mass. It all depends on what you're finding the mass of. But at the heart of it, the thing is really simple. Mass of, so if you're trying to measure, let's suppose re relative atomic mass. So if I were to say relative atomic mass, then here's how I will explain it. I'll say it is the mass of all naturally occurring isotopes. So you see, we can make new isotopes. So I'm going to put extra parts in the bracket. So you can put this here. So mass of all naturally occurring isotopes. If you write just mass of all isotopes, that's also acceptable in the exam. Compared to one twelfth of carbon 12. Again, you can simply put this one twelfth in the bracket compared to carbon 12 is also fine. So this is what relative mass is. It's a mass of one thing compared to carbon 12. Obviously one is one twelfth of carbon 12, but if, if it is, if it sounds confusing to you, skip that part. In O levels, examiner is not finicky about that one twelfth part. In A levels, they are, they really expect students to write one twelfth and the naturally occurring part. But in all levels of IGCC, you can just get away with this, that mass of all isotopes compared to carbon 12. This will be atomic mass, uh, which is why things like chlorine, they have a mass in decimals. It doesn't make sense if you consider that this is nucleon number because you can't have half a proton or half a neutron. You can't have that. But this is not nucleon number. Nucleon number will always be a whole number. Proton number will always be a whole number. Why? Because you're literally counting how many protons or neutrons and anything else. But when it comes to comparison or when it comes to average, okay, so relative mass is actually average. So average 
can be in decimals because it's a mathematical thing, right? So it can be in decimals. That is why we can say that this is 35.5 means the average is there. So how does this average thing work? So for that, usually in, especially in IDCSE, they get asked these questions like, okay, there's some element X and X has one mass, uh, 235. Uh, I'll answer that in a bit, Zan. And another mass is 238. Okay, so that's how it is. And turns out that you have, uh, this occurs 67% of the time and this occurs 33% of the time, which means two third of all the X that you get in nature is this one. And one third of all the X that you get in nature is this one. Okay, so this is called abundance. Abundance means how much is this thing common in nature? Okay. So this is its abundance. Now, how will the average change based on this? So it's important for you to understand how the average shifts on a number line. So let me, let me put a number line here. So this is a number line. We have 235 here and 238 here. So I'm just for the ease, I'm going to put the numbers inside. So there's 236, there's 237. How many steps is 238 away from it? You can see that this is one step, two step and three steps. So it is three steps away. All right, so for simplicity, let's just assume that average was right here in the middle, right in the middle. If there were 50%, both of them, 235 was 50%, 238 was 50%, average will be exactly in the middle. So it will be 32, 36, 15. But here's the thing. This is when it is 50%. If I increase the 235 valley side, then there's going to be a tug of war between them. The average is going to prefer the side that has more abundance. So over here, you can see that this is 67%, that is 33%. So the average is going to be twice as close to this than the other one, because the ratio is two to one. So this means it is two times closer to X 235 and then compared to X 238. And what does that mean? That means the average is going to be here, where the distance from 235 is half of the distance from 238. Okay. And now we can say that the X 236, this is the average and 236 is the relative atomic mass, which we'll write as AR. Many elements show this. For example, bromine. Bromine X has 79 and bromine 81. That is the one that's present in nature. But this is 50% and that is 50%. So I'll just put a number line here. There's 79 here, 80 here, 81 here. Tell me where should the average be and what is the AR of bromine without calculations? 80, very good. How did you figure that out? Yeah, so it is 50, 50, which means this distance is half and that distance is half or the ratio is one to one, which is why we know that they should be exactly in the middle. So this is where the average is going to be. Let me do another example. Maybe that will help. So let's suppose we have uh, chlorine 35, chlorine 37. Okay. So 35, 37, right in the middle, we have 36. Okay. Turns out this is 75% in nature and that is 25% in nature. Let's try to figure out a ratio for them. This is three, that is one. So that's the ratio. Uh, this means that the value should be three times closer to 35 compared to 37. Or in other words, it should be three times as far from 37 than from 35, right? The average value. So where would it be? How many total parts do you have? Four, right? So break the distance between the two numbers into four parts. Okay, there you go, four parts. And put the three ratio here, this is where it should be. Not 36.5, because that would mean that it is three steps away from 35 and one step away from 37. No, it is three steps away from the other one because 35 is zyada hai. It is three times closer to it. Does that make sense? So this is the average, 35.5. So we don't have to do calculations for this. We can just use the ratios like that on a number line. But sometimes we need to do calculations. Let's suppose, uh, they give us a weird example. Let me just pick one up. So let's suppose we have, uh, yeah, so here you go. We have this element. 
So here's how it goes. So we have magnesium 24, 25, 26, and that's the percentage that they have. So it will be a little hard if you try to do it through the number line method. So there's 24, 25, 26. Ah, uh, I don't know. The ratios are weird. There should be another way, which there is. Now the number line method actually works for P1 because then you can save time. But this will usually be asked in paper four for IGCSE or paper two for O levels. So how do we do this? You simply take the value of the mass and you multiply it by the percentage. So 79 over 100 here, 25 with 10%, and 26 with 11%. Okay, and then you just add it all up. So this is the share of 24, this is the share of 25, and that is the share of 26. And then when you add them up, you get a final value. And that value is your relative atomic mass. Okay, and scientists have done the relative atomic mass calculation very precisely, and they put them in periodic table. So as you can see that, the bigger number in the priority table for every element, that is this number. Uh, the ones that you get in your exams, they do not show nuclear number. They show average mass, which means the relative atomic mass compared with carbon 12. Okay, so remember that. They do not show nuclear number. Is everybody clear on this? All right, what do we do if you want to find mass of any molecule? So MR, what is that? MR is basically sum of everything that's inside it. So MR is really easy. You have any element, let uh, any compound, let's suppose we have C2H5OH. This is the formula for ethanol. This is one of the formulas that you need to memorize for your exams. So ethanol is there. Now I want to figure out what is the mass of this thing and what is the relative mass of this thing, like average mass of all the things that are there. So I don't have to find individual isotopes of carbon that make ethanol or individual isotopes of hydrogen or oxygen that make ethanol. I don't want to get into that because it will be really, really messy. In fact, we delay it to A2. That is where we actually get to calculate all of this. Uh, so what do we do? We just take the average of carbon. We take the average of hydrogen. We take the average of oxygen and we multiply it. Okay, so I have two carbons. So the first step is always to break things down into what they're they, they, what particles make them up. So this is made from two carbons, six hydrogen. Notice that this one had hy five hydrogens here and one here. So I've combined them and I've worked six hydrogens. If you wanted to write five on one side and H later on, that's also fine. But I don't see why you would do that. Uh, similarly, you have one oxygen. We can just write O for that. Uh, try to make your O's a little italic if you can, because if you write them like zeros, you yourselves can get confused as to whether it was a zero or an O. Uh, so this is going to be two times 12 because I'm taking the value from periodic table, which shows that this is 12. For this, I'm taking the priority value of one. And for this, I'm taking the priority value of 16. Remember, this is nucleon number. In fact, this is the relative mass, relative atomic mass of that thing. Uh, oxygen has eight protons, but I won't put eight here. I'll put 16 because that is the mass compared to carbon 12. So I add it all up, I get 24 here, six here, 16 there, gives me 46 and there you go. Good enough, right? So on a scale where carbon is 12, ethanol is 46. That's what it shows. And we use this, especially in chapter one, when we're calculating which thing will uh, diffuse faster. We know that kinetic energy formula tells us that half mv square is there. So mass slows things down, which means ethanol, and carbon dioxide, let's say you have a comparison between carbon dioxide and ethanol vapors, then you know carbon is 12 and there's two oxygen. So that is two times 16, which is 44. So you know that ethanol is going to be slightly slower than carbon dioxide when they diffuse because they both have quite similar mass. And of course, one big chapter that we use this is moles. Yes, Michelle, you're right. So moles will rely on ethanol, oh, sorry, the calculations and mass and all that a lot. Okay. So I hope you guys understand what relative mass means. So relative isotopic mass, relative molecular mass, relative atomic mass. Uh, one more thing. We also call it relative formula mass. So MR, don't be confused with it that this always means molecule. Uh, it can be relative molecular mass 
or it can be relative formula mass. Now, what's the difference? It is called a molecule if you are talking about a molecule and molecules are for covalent substances. And we'll get to that. I know you guys have some fair idea of what covalent substances are. And formula mass is when you're talking about ionic compounds, which don't really have molecules, okay? So if I wanted to do it for NaCl, then although my calculations will be simply that I take Na, which is 23, and I say take chlorine, which is 35.5, and I say, okay, this is 58.5. The method is the same, except this one is relative formula mass, and this one is relative molecular mass, but I'll still write MR, okay? I won't write something else because at the heart of it, these are relative masses, right? So the term, if you want to write it fully, make sure that you know what compounds you're talking about. For molecules, it will be relative molecular mass. For uh, ionic compound, it will be relative formula mass, okay? Uh, I don't see a reason why you would like to write the full term. You can simply write MR for both of them and take, get, a, get rid of the confusion altogether. Okay, so that is uh, atomic structure. Now we have to talk about electronic configuration. Like we have talked about protons, we have talked about extensively about neutrons and their effects on things being isotopes and how they affect the relative mass and all that. But what about electrons? Electrons are at the heart of any chemical reaction, as I've told you. And it's the valence electron that makes things or compounds or makes whatever thing. So the way they're arranged is called electron configuration or electronic configuration. You can call it either of those. Electronic configuration is also fine. For this, you have to understand how electrons are arranged. First of all, electrons are arranged in shells. These shells have further divisions in them. One way to look at shells is like uh, the grades that we have in schools. Uh, so you know that, uh, uh, for example, you have grade one and you have grade two and you have grade three and four and five and all that, right? A student cannot be in it, a student can be in any of the grades, but they cannot be in uh, like one half of a grade. So a student is either in grade one or in grade two, not in the middle. That's one. Secondly, the higher the grade the students, student has, then we expect them to have greater knowledge than the other one, right? There's a certain level of knowledge that they want, we would expect a grade 10 student to have compared to a grade nine student, even though their ages might not differ by that much. In fact, there are students that are older in lower grades or younger students in higher grades. That's perfectly normal, but it is the knowledge that they, they've accumulated and they've understood things that determines what grade they fall in, right? So shells are like that. Just like students can be in separate grades and those grades go in numbers, shells go like that. So shell can be one, two, three, four, so on. And the lower the number, lower the energy. So shells one, two, three, four. So as the number grows, so does the energy. And in fact, these shells are actually called energy levels. Now, here's the thing. Uh, most of you are in grade 11. Some of you are nine, some of you are 10. Look at yourself and find one feature that you have that shows that you are in grade nine or you are in grade 11. Is there any physical feature that tells you that you're in grade 11 or in grade nine or in grade 10? There is none. Because somebody being in grade nine doesn't have anything to do with their physical appearance or what they do and all that, it all depends on their mental capabilities or their experiences. Age, size, weight, those can be starkly different and you will find examples that just simply did not agree with them. <laughs> sure. So a physical feature cannot be an indication of what grade anybody is in. Okay. In fact, we live in a country where I think 5 million students are out of 
5 million kids are out of school they have every right to be there they have every feature to be there but they for some reason they cannot it is sad so just like that electrons are in energy levels and those energy levels are not a physical thing you go to your school grade 9 isn't really a physical thing in your school grade 11 isn't really a physical thing in your school one day they're like this is the room for grade 11 the other day they're like this is the room for grade 11 you will start going there but that doesn't mean that that room is what grade 11 means when the schools were closed and we were having online classes you were still in grade 9 right or grade 11 so grade 11 is not really a physical thing it's a concept just like that these electrons they have energies that energy makes them move that energy gives them properties that they can react and they are stable or unstable and all that it is not a physical circle or place in the atom and that's very important for you to understand so when i draw this that when i say that okay uh, calcium has this 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 and this i'm not really drawing how calcium atom would look like and when i put circles here i'm not really saying that these are circles and electrons look like this all i'm saying is why am i drawing circles first of all the larger circles the ones that i have here like this is shell number 1 shell number 2 shell number 3 shell number 4 these larger circles are basically telling me the level of energy that oh these in the first one have lower energy than these in the second one and all eight that are in the second one have the same energy and all eight in the third one have the same energy that's what i'm saying okay now how do electrons arrange themselves as i've already drawn the shells have capacity so shell capacity every shell remember one thing electrons try to be in pairs so every shell can have n square pairs this is their capacity but doesn't mean you have to fill to capacity the preferred numbers that they have i think this is wrong spelling of preferred the preferred numbers are 2 8 8 and so on they want to get 8 doesn't mean that that's what they'll get sometimes they get 1 2 7 6 but they try to get 2 or 8 and that is called octet rule they they want if they can they will try to make it eight that's it okay so whenever you're trying to do this first thing fill lower levels first that's the first principle when you're trying to fill any atom and number two use the preferred capacity octet rule use that So the biggest atom in your syllabus is calcium. So let's start with calcium. Calcium has twenty protons, which means it has twenty electrons. And twenty electrons. Let's arrange them. So level one can have two. So I'll just put two there. Level two can have eight. So I'll just put eight there. So so far I've put ten in there, and I'm left with just ten more. Third can also have eight. So I'll put eight there. Third can have more, but I won't because the preferred capacity is octet rule which is 8 and the total is 2 left so i'll put that there now in your exams unless they ask you to draw all the shells just draw the last shell so they might ask you to draw calcium but if you just draw this that's fine because only the out why is that important because in any chemical reaction only the outer shell is important the inner shells they're complete they don't really bother about chemical reaction and all that so just put this there okay the valency shell the outer shell and that's good important uh now what will at atoms try to do and this is at the heart of any chemical reaction they will try to make any atom that of preferred capacity they will try to make eight for every shell and if they cannot they will go to many lengths to achieve that All right thank you so much